Good morning, gang. How are you? Here's a headline. I'm just waiting on a quorum. Here we go. Okay. Not sure if I'm going to be able to see your names as they scroll. Ah, TC, you were first today. Look at you. Rick Hutchinson, she beat you in, didn't she? Hello, Sean Nichols. Nice to see you from the Jersey Shore. David Bryan hates Steven Singer. Mitchell Davis is joining us as well. Matt Adams. Hello, Matt. Kathy Lee Tricola. Cheryl Reitz Sarnecki from Michigan. Gina Bagnoli Millwood. Mark Charlton from Langhorn, PA. Kathy Zolkowitz. What's with all the uh, three-part names today? Greetings to all. Greetings to all. So here's where I think we are. It's the 25th of July. Summer is flying by. And the president, I think, is trailing badly in the presidential race thus far. There's just too much polling data out there, all telling the exact same story. And it makes common sense that given his handling of the pandemic, the situation with joblessness, uh, his being out of touch with the desire for many in the country for there to be some sense of racial justice, uh, he's behind as of now. Do I count him out? I do not count him out, but he's behind. And the question becomes, what's he going to do to try to make up the ground? Because the election is, if I'm not mistaken, 14 weeks from Tuesday, That's a little bit misleading because many people will begin casting ballots early as soon as five or six weeks from now. My point being, we're getting down to crunch time. And I think we can see the the playbook, the strategy of the president in two ways right now. It is person, woman, man, camera, TV. Person, woman, man, camera, TV. Person, woman, man, camera, TV. It is to go after Joe's cognitive skills or lack thereof. That Joe has lost a step, says the president to Chris Wallace, and he's just not sharp enough to be commander in chief. So that is strategy number one. And, you know, by the way, give the president credit. He sat out there for an hour with Chris Wallace in 100 degree temperatures. It was his choice to do so. He is laying the groundwork so that when there is some misspoken word by Joe Biden as we get toward the election, he's going to say, aha. And of course, there will be misspoken words because put a camera on any of us and, you know, that's just the nature of of humankind. So it's cognition, but it's also crime. It's also crime. And I, if you saw the headline on this Facebook Live, I said statistics or stories, or statistics versus stories. And let me tell you what I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of. And, and just in terms, not that you need convincing, but let me try and show you. I'm going to angle my camera on my laptop. You've seen this commercial, right? A million times. You have reached the 911 police emergency line. Due to defunding of the police department, of course you have. we're sorry, but no one is here to take your call. If you're calling to report a rape, please press 1. To report a murder, press 2. To report a home invasion, press 3. For all other crimes, leave your name and number, and someone will get back to you. Yeah, someone will get back to you, but it won't be Joe Biden. Hang on. Goodbye. And then there's a variant of that commercial which shows an elderly woman who's on the phone while somebody is putting a crowbar in her front door. These commercials, and and look, look at the tagline that comes up on the screen. Look at this. You won't be safe in Joe Biden's America. I, I think that those commercials are scaring the crap out of people. And if you watch Fox News in prime time, they are showing mayhem on a loop. And the question that I have is whether fear is warranted. I have no doubt, I need to be very clear in how I say this to all of you here on Facebook Live, and I need to be clear how I'll say this on CNN, even though I'm sure people will hear what they want to hear and draw conclusions uh, therefrom. But I want to be very clear. Minneapolis certainly had a problem with violence in the street, looting 
in the aftermath of, of the killing of George Floyd. We saw what happened in Seattle in the Chaz zone. Now there are problems in Portland, and of course, there are always problems in Chicago. But is the whole nation on fire? I mean, that's my question. My question is whether the lawlessness of those handful of cities is indicative of what's going on in the country generally. And I have yet to see the data that suggests that's the case. I showed you a headline. This is from the Oregonian. This is, this is what in part got me thinking in this way. Headline from the Oregonian. Feds right-wing media paint Portland as city under siege a tour of town shows otherwise. And this very detailed report from the Oregonian says that the citizens of Portland don't recognize their city in the national depiction. Again, not ignoring the fact that in a 16 block area, bad shit's happening, but not in Portland generally. Quote, the vast majority of Portland residents spend quiet homebound lives on hushed tree-lined streets with coronavirus and its resulting economic catastrophe as the greatest threat to their well-being. Or there was this. The national media reports, particularly those published in right-wing outlets, suggest a vastly different version of how safe it is for children and families to stroll through downtown Portland. Many people who live in Portland, including, and then they quote somebody, have heard over the past few days from worried relatives in other states who feared that their loved ones in Portland might have been affected by fires or caught in police crossfire as they went about their day. Do you, do you know what this is reminding me of? And those of you who listen to me on Sirius XM will probably guess where I'm going. It reminds me of the summer of the shark. The summer of 2001 was the summer of the shark. And every day, the news media brought to you a different report of a shark attack. And the only reason the summer of the shark ended is because of the tragic events of September 11 knocked it off the news pages. Guess what? When they went back and they looked at the data, they recognized that in the summer of 2001, there were fewer shark attacks than there had been in the surrounding years. Um, here's another example, the Dominican Republic. And I, I called this as it went down. Those of you who listen to me on radio remember that I said two years ago, hey, this is a great time to go to the DR. The media was all worked into a lather. Oh my God, Americans are dying in the Dominican Republic. And when you looked at each one of these cases, you found that these were people with pre-existing illnesses, you know, they, they, had, oh, they had diabetes, they were obese, whatever the case may have been, and they were dying of natural causes. So many people go to the Dominican Republic that it's only natural, I said at the time, that some of them are gonna die. And people were worried about the mini bars. Oh my God, the mini bar. People are dying from drinking uh, rum from the mini. In the end, there was not a single cause. There was nothing untoward. You know, there wasn't somebody out there killing everybody who went to the Dominican Republic. I want to underscore, now I'm going to say it twice, bad things are happening right now in Portland, in a small area. Too many people are being shot in Chicago, 15 last weekend. Um, how about that, uh, that, that grisly triple murder in Florida of the guys going fishing? And, and some guy with a long rap sheet thinks that they stole his truck and his, his engine? My question is whether it's all interconnected and whether it warrants, and whether it warrants this kind of fear. And I have the perfect guy to ask all of this. His name is Steven Pinker. And Steven Pinker is a psychologist from Harvard who wrote a book a couple of years ago, which is called Better Angels of Our Nature. And he looked at history, psychology, cognitive science, economics, and sociology. He looked at data. And he concluded that right now, to be alive, particularly in the United States, our era is less violent, less cruel, more peaceful than any previous period of human existence. So I want to ask him. He's a really smart, data-driven guy. Is fear today warranted? That's my question. 
And, and the survey question today is going to ask you if our perceptions today are being driven more by statistics or stories. Anyway, sorry for the long uh, uh, windup, but I, I've not seen anybody else address that subject. So I have a rather long opening commentary that I'm going to deliver at the outset of the program and try and lay it out. And I am sure that some will say, oh, he's denying the unrest. And I'm telling you that is bullshit. I am not denying what I'm seeing on television in those handful of circumstances. And it may be indicative of what's going on all across the country. I don't know. But I haven't seen data that suggests it. And instead, I worry that some among us, particularly seniors, are being scared to death, that they can't walk out the door because that, that old lady on the phone waiting for Joe Biden to answer it, you know, some, some that guy who crowbarred her door, he's getting in. He's getting in. So what else? Um, all right, so there's that. Opening commentary, Steven Pinker. Uh, this is a National Review story that ran recently. Where is the headline? There it is. How the Supreme Court's DACA decision harms the Constitution, the presidency, Congress, and the country. It was written by John Yu, who is a Berkeley law professor, very conservative Berkeley law professor. What? Did I say he's at Berkeley and he's conservative? Yes, John Yu provided the legal foundation for, you know, infamously for the... Uh, uh, Bush harsh interrogation methods. That National Review story was spied, says Axios, on the Resolute desk. The president is looking to John Yu's work as justification for expanding federal executive power. And John Yu will be my guest so that I can ask him, among other things, in what circumstances can the feds go into Portland? So I'm thrilled to have him. Uh, did you see the stories this week about the federal government cutting a number of deals with Big Pharma so that we are assured of having sufficient dosages of the vaccine when it's finalized? I have a lot of questions about that, about the distribution, uh, about what happens if we cut a deal with Pfizer, but all of a sudden it's someone else who comes up with a more efficacious vaccine. Gerald Posner literally wrote the book on Big Pharma. He will join me. And, and also, I'm going to talk to, um, pardon me for just a moment, I'm going to talk to this woman. She's a beautician in Massachusetts. Her name is Kristen Martin. Do you see the sign? Whoops, there it is. So the beautician puts up a sign in front of her business that says Black Lives Matter. She has a sign next to it that salutes the emergency workers in the fight against coronavirus. The Black Lives Matter sign was stolen three or four times, and she's been getting a workout in her community. Some of her clients say, not all of them, but some of her clients say, hey, I'm not going to patronize you because you're supporting Black Lives Matter. So the question that I ask is whether support, public support of Black Lives Matter makes you more inclined, less inclined, or, or about the same to be supportive of a business like hers. That's the show. Um, I'm really interested in what you think about the statistics versus stories angle that I have. Again, for all I know, the country is in flames, but I want to see the data. Does that make sense to you? I mean, what are you seeing anecdotally where you are? Frankly, it would make sense that there would be an increase in crime and violence given, if nothing else, how many people are unemployed today and the fact that there's a pandemic. So you've got, you know, a combination of cabin fever of people who can't do the things they want to do and joblessness. It seems like a pres prescription for catastrophe. But when I watch television and when I, when I see some of the media coverage, I come away with what I fear is a distorted picture of what's going on. And I'm wondering, is it the summer of the shark? Is it the Dominican Republic again? And I'm just asking. I want numbers. I want numbers. And when I looked at crime data this week, I concluded that you can spin these numbers any way you want. The preliminary numbers. 
The FBI numbers will come out next year and tell us what really went on this year. So post a comment here and tell me what you think. Share this video with some friends and, uh, and see what they think. Statistics or stories? Are we being guided more right now by statistics or stories? Statistics from some areas, for sure. 15 people shot in Chicago last weekend, that's a statistic. But a lot of the rest of it that I see are stories, are stories. <clears throat> Gary, let's see when unemployment benefits are cut. Yeah, you mean the increase in unemployment benefits. Um, it's hard for me to keep up with your comments because there's so many and they're flying by. Mary Jane Thomas, if CNN doesn't report it, it's not happening? No, no, no. I'm not saying that at all, Mary Jane. I'm saying, as I always say, change the channel. Watch everything. When, when I see on a loop in prime time on Fox, I mean on a loop, it is only that, that the sky is falling. That doesn't convince me that it's the case. I need to see the data. How many times are you going to show me the footage of a 14-block area of Portland? When I, when I then read a story from Portland that says the people of Portland don't recognize their town, then I question. That's my nature. That is my nature. And, and Anthony Carrier is right in saying, like, to lay off on uh, the current climate, Chicago, I, I don't see, I don't see Chicago, I don't see Chicago as being linked to Portland and Seattle. Chicago's been this way for as long as I can remember, right? So it's a god-awful shame that so many people were shot last weekend on one day, but I'm not tying that in the way that, that, that some in the media are to, oh my God, Chicago, Seattle, Portland. I don't think that it's that way. I mean, when I look at Portland from 3,000 miles away, I, I see a magnet for malcontents. There are some among us Go back to the Occupy movement. There are some among us who are, who are just, there's, there, there's so many disparate complaints, just people looking to go out and, and to air their grievance, regardless of the time period. So, <clears throat> all right. Camera, man, woman, porno. I think I got it. Gang, thank you so, so much. Post a comment, share this with a friend, and please be watching at 9 a.m. Vote on the survey question at smirconish.com as well. Have you registered for the newsletter? It's free. I've already done my read-in. I've identified the links that will be sent out before I hit the airwaves. More than 25,000 have already registered for it. And if you're one of them, I, uh, I thank you. And give TC some play on TC After Dark as well, her brand new podcast. All right, see you, gang.